Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And in this episode, we would like to thank our Stegosaurus patrons, Kyle, Brendan, the Tolbert family, Sean Tanagaki, Remy Rodriguez, and Marcy. And Marcy just joined, so thanks, Marcy. Yay, thanks to all our Stegosaurus patrons and all of our patrons. We really appreciate your support. It helps keep us going, and we're excited to offer some exclusive Patreon rewards for our upcoming trip at SVP. Yeah, we're going up to Canada in just about three weeks now for the annual Society of Vertebrate Paleontology Conference, which is really mostly about dinosaurs. <laughs> it was kind of founded by vertebrate paleontologists who... We're interested in dinosaurs, so it's no surprise that that's a big focus. And we're also announcing a new Patreon level, the Spinosaurus level. And to get that level, it's $50 a month, and you'll get exclusive access to all of our audiobooks and books one month early. And we're about to release our next audiobook, too. So it's a good time to join that level, also since it didn't exist until now. <laughs> yep. And yeah, thanks to our listeners who participated in our survey. That feedback was really helpful in shaping this reward and other things we'll be doing. And for this episode, our dinosaur of the day is Bahariosaurus. And we have an interview with Danny Barta, a PhD candidate at the American Museum of Natural History, as well as a bunch of dinosaur news. But first, we want to give a quick correction from our last episode. Thanks to Lythronax Argestes on Reddit for pointing out that Antarctopelta, which was our dinosaur of the day last week, may be a nomen dubium, which we didn't mention during the dinosaur of the day segment. And that was published by Arbor and Curry a few years ago, basically saying that it's not different enough from some other dinosaurs to warrant its own genus. And in this case, they also think that there might have been some marine reptile fossils thrown in the mix. <laughs> Good to know. Yep. Jumping right into the news, we have a new dinosaur species to talk about, and this one was published in the Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences by David Evans and others. And it's really new, but, you know, it's one of these where we've had the fossil for a long time, they just decided to classify it as a new genus. So, it's a troodontid bone known as TMP 1993.105.0001. Oof. <laughs> and it was found in the Horseshoe Canyon Formation near the Royal Tyrrell Museum, and it's estimated to be about 71 million years old, also known as the Late Cretaceous, and it was found back in the 90s, hence the name that starts with 1993. But it was previously just referred to as a troodon remain. So when they re-examined it, they found that it appears different enough to warn its own genus, and they named it Albertavenator curiae, which is obviously named after Alberta and Phil Curry. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> they call the skull of Albertavenator considerably more robust and shorter than Troodon, and that's what kind of gives it its own classification. They're always way more specific about it, using tons of Latin prefixes and suffixes about like little bumps on bones and things that are different, but that's really the gist of it. And you might know that Troodontid remains are really rare in North America. They're much more common in Asia, so finding a new one in North America is pretty cool. Unfortunately, all they have from this fossil is the partial left frontal, which is the area above the left eye, and it kind of goes over to the middle of the top of the head, but it doesn't go all the way back to the back of the skull. You know, it's kind of like if it was on a human, it would kind of be like the left forehead through the middle of the top of the head. Fortunately, the authors believe that this bone is diagnostic enough to really define a new genus, and they also commented that teeth near this find are quite a bit different than teeth found near Troodon remains, so that could be another clue that it might be a different genus. Probably because it's just such a small bone that they found, they didn't guess at the overall size of the animal, but they did say that it was from a small individual, so I don't know. We really don't know too much about the size. I guess you would probably postulate that it's similar in size to Troodon, which is, you know, kind of dog-sized, 
big dog sized, <laughs> you know, kind of up to your waist sort of height. And congratulations to Phil Curry, who got another dinosaur named after him. I think he might be the recipient of the most dinosaur namesakes at this point. We just had another one about a month ago when we covered Leoningvenator Curry I. I think there's quite a few now, so he might be in the lead. I couldn't find like a good list of who has the most dinosaurs named after them. Next in Colorado, a group from Colorado Northwestern Community College is working to dig out Walter, who is a hadrosaurid with preserved skin and is currently in a sandstone cliff. So a dog named Walter found the hadrosaur Walter four <laughs> years ago when hiking with his owners. And so far, the team at Colorado Northwestern Community College has found limb bones, most of the pelvis, some ribs, part of the skull, and they're working to get the rest of the pelvis skull and vertebral column out. Walter, the dinosaur, not the dog, is probably about 40 to 50 feet long, and about 500 people have gotten to touch Walter's skin. These are volunteers who've helped out over the years, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, preserved skin is always awesome. Mm -hmm. Next up is kind of a fun paper that was published in the International Journal of Earth Sciences by Gregory Paul. And he published what he called a comment on an obsolete hypothesis, <laughs> which sounds kind of funny. Like, well, why are you commenting on it if you think it's obsolete? But it's kind of to reiterate that it's obsolete more than anything. You might remember we covered an article from the same journal at the end of last year that stated that ectothermic or cold-blooded dinosaurs could have lived in Antarctica and migrated out during colder months. And it was kind of an argument for like, well, maybe... The fact that dinosaurs have been found in Antarctica doesn't completely eliminate the possibility that they were cold-blooded. So he has some issues with that. Specifically, he talks about how no land animals migrate far enough to make this feasible. So just to kind of explain why he said land animals don't migrate far enough, a humpback whale was recently tracked going almost 14,000 miles round trip in a migration from Mexico to Russia and back. Wow. Yeah. And there are lots of bats and birds that go well over 10,000 miles round trip in their migrations. None of them use their feet. Nope. <laughs> and the <laughs> longest one I could find was the Arctic Tern, which goes 44,000 miles round trip between Greenland and Antarctica every year. Why? It's just, I don't know. I guess that's where the food is. And it must be a little zigzaggy because I think if you flew straight, it would be a lot less than that. Mm -hmm. But pretty Maybe amazing. Just like sightseeing. No, <laughs> I think it's probably for food or mating. Yeah, it seems yeah. like there should be lots of food in between. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. By comparison, in Africa, zebras and wildebeest don't even go a thousand miles in a year of migration. Some sources were saying that wildebeest could go a thousand miles, but then another place said that zebras are the current record holder in Africa at 300 miles. Obviously not very long compared to 44,000 miles. Well, as a human, that sounds far to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and for some scale, if you go 500 miles from the middle of Antarctica, you're still in Antarctica. So even if you're doing a thousand miles round trip, it doesn't even get you out of Antarctica, likely. Also, according to Guinness, the longest terrestrial migration is 3,000 miles, which is done by a caribou in Canada and Alaska. Just a caribou? Yeah, I don't think they necessarily go as a large group. They're oh. not like wildebeest where it's like miles and miles of them. But yeah, it might be more than one. I don't know. I think, you know, when they track these things, they just have one tracker. It's not like they track all of the individuals. Sure. And then kind of the most pivotal piece of this is Gregory Paul points out that if dinosaurs were ectothermic, aka cold-blooded, they wouldn't be able to match the endothermic animal's activity rate. So even if they were kind of competing with the farthest they could possibly migrate, as an ectothermic animal, they wouldn't have been able to go as far as one of these caribou or something. So they wouldn't have really been able to go far enough to avoid a cold winter, if that's the argument you're going for. And then finally, Paul points out that there are quite a few points during the Cretaceous when Antarctica wasn't connected to the other continents, so you wouldn't be able to migrate over land anyway. You kind of got stuck there. <laughs> <laughs> so he considers the idea of dinosaurs being cold-blooded an obsolete hypothesis. And it does seem like that's generally the scientific consensus at this point. Mm -hmm. 
Next up, there's a new article published in PLOS One by Anshuman Das and others, and it looks at a new method to digitize fossils. So the coolest thing about this one is all it requires is a single Microsoft Connect V2 module, which is just the Connect that comes with the Xbox One, as well as some free software and then something to hold or push the Connect sensor around on. So pretty simple setup. The Connect natively uses time of flight data to measure the environment. That's how it tracks people when you dance around in front of it and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. And it's accurate to 0.6 millimeters or 600 micrometers, which is really precise. I was surprised that it could be so accurate. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And another cool thing about it is all they have to do to scan it is basically just slowly walk around the fossil holding the sensor as steady as possible. They said one time they kind of put it on a little dolly. And it only took about two minutes to do a lap around the T-Rex Sioux skull, which is pretty big. And they that's like it. You've got it all scanned at that point. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So they did a scan of Sioux skull as well as another T-Rex. And both of them looked really good. The teeth didn't look great because, especially on the T-Rex, you can really notice the serrations if you look at them in person. But the serrations are only about 100 micrometers. So that's too small to be picked up by the Kinect sensor. I checked on Amazon and you can get one of these sensors for about $50 and then the adapter is about $50 to use it with a computer. And you can use a pretty standard Windows laptop. They said the one they used cost $1,500. I think you could get one for about $1,000 and most labs probably already have one, you know, a computer that could handle the kind of processing it needs to do. So that's just made things much easier potentially. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. And then even cooler than that is you can just plop the files into Shapeways, which is free software, I believe, and then 3D print out whatever you scanned in a couple minutes. I mean, scanned in a couple minutes, it probably takes longer than yeah. that to print. <laughs> For now, give it a few years. Yeah. So that means the total investment is likely only about $100 for the sensor since they don't need that laptop. And compared to the industry standard structured light scanner, which costs $50,000, that's remarkably affordable. But then again, that structured light scanner does have the benefit of going down to 100 micrometers versus 600 micrometers. So I might have been able to see those serration and some other details. But, you know, a lot of times these paleontology departments are pretty financially restricted. So anything that can be done cheaper is always good. Mm -hmm. Plus the technology could get better eventually. Yeah. Yeah. If there's like a new version of the Connect that could go down to like 100 micrometers, then it's like almost as good as whatever kind of structured light you could find. Mm hmm and they mentioned, too, that it's a, it's a little bit better than photogrammetry and some of those things because they sometimes have issues with little pits and things like that, seeing how deep they are. Like sometimes if you look at photogrammetry, they have these bottomless pits <laughs> <laughs> where it looks like the hole just goes like all the way through it. But hopefully that wouldn't happen with the Connect. I would have never thought of that. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. The picture that they show in the paper has like a guy standing in three positions around it holding a connect sensor mm -hmm. and so i assumed that you needed three people holding them at like the right angles and i was like oh this sounds interesting but that looks a little bit cumbersome but it was supposed to show that it was the same guy moving around yeah. <laughs> which is obviously a lot easier to do yeah cool next thanks to chris who shared this one with us via twitter so dippy the dinosaur has been officially replaced now by the blue whale skeleton named hope and was unveiled at the Natural History Museum in London pretty recently. So Hope is 85 feet long, 126 years old, and suspended from the ceiling. And director Sir Michael Dixon said he believes Hope will be just as popular and iconic as Dippy. It's gotten a lot of positive feedback so far. People seem to like Hope. Yeah, the big blue whales are cool. I like the one in AM&H mm -hmm. in the hall with all the taxidermy. You can lay down under it and look at it and mm -hmm. how huge it is. But, you know, it's no dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the bones are real, so that's something. Yeah, literally real. They're not fossils. They're like, yeah. that was in an animal just a couple hundred years ago. 126 years. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I wonder when they say it's 126 years old, is that like when they got the bones? Oh. Or is that like how old it was when it died? Because at that point, it's hard to tell. We never have that problem with fossils because you know nothing lives 80 million years. <laughs> <laughs> Next in Japan, there's the Giga Dinosaur Exhibition 2017 in Chiba, and it runs until September 3rd, if you're interested in seeing it. And you can see more than 200 objects, including dinosaur fossils. 
One is a 38 meter long reconstructed Riangosaurus, which is the largest dinosaur put on exhibit in Japan. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Speaking of exhibits, Dinosaurs Alive is on exhibit in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia for the next six months. There's more than 40 life-sized dinosaurs, and they're expecting to have five to 6,000 visitors daily. So if you're in Malaysia and want to see them, go for it. <laughs> you have Sabrina's permission. Yeah. <laughs> or if you're in Singapore or somewhere nearby, I don't think it's that hard to get to Malaysia. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. Next, Science Alert compiled a map of the biggest scientific discoveries in every U.S. state. The dinosaur discoveries include Nanooksaurus, found in Alaska in 2014, Barnum Brown, finding the first T-Rex in Montana in 1902, and Zoo Wiley, being found in North Dakota, Dakota Raptor, found in South Dakota, 2015, Nazutoceratops, found in Utah, which is a relative of Triceratops, but it's got a long nose, and Como Bluff in Wyoming, just being home to many dinosaurs, <laughs> including <laughs> Allosaurus, Stegosaurus, Camarasaurus, Diplodocus, and Apatosaurus. So that's a pretty decent amount of states known for their dinosaur discoveries. Yeah. I kind of wonder when I was looking at that list, because why did they pick that Ceratopsian from Utah rather than like Utah Raptor? It's a or, good question. Yeah. it's just. <laughs> I don't know what the criteria was it at all. It seemed like maybe the criteria was somebody Googled a state name and a scientific discovery and just picked whatever came up first. <laughs> well, I did think it was interesting how most of the states had a specific dinosaur discovery and then Wyoming is just like this area, <laughs> all the dinosaurs. Yeah, because if you're going to do that, it should be the Hell Creek in Montana, hands down. You know, <laughs> that's what everybody knows. <laughs> but it's cool to see this kind of recognition. True, yeah. Next, we talked a few episodes ago about how Drumheller in Alberta, Canada is considering naming downtown streets after dinosaurs. So they pulled the town and they found that Albertosaurus is the most popular dinosaur. It's the first dinosaur named after Alberta, and that was named over 100 years ago. So that's not too surprising. People got to vote over a two-week period. They had 3,000 votes, and Albertosaurus beat T-Rex by just 16 votes. Ten streets in downtown will now have secondary dinosaur names. So aside from Albertosaurus and T-Rex, the other winners are Triceratops, Ankylosaurus, Gorgosaurus, Troodon, Centrosaurus, Edmontosaurus, Stegosaurus, and Parasaurolophus. Pretty good selection. No sauropods in there. Yeah, I was a little disappointed, but... There's Ankylosaurus, though. The people know. <laughs> the people have spoken, oh, Sabrina. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that was only 3,000 people. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot to mention when I was talking about Alberta Venator, it's Alberta rather than Albertosaurus, you know? Yeah. It's actually the feminine version, just like the actual province. Cool. Yeah, I like that. Next, we promised Laura from Facebook that we would mention Scotland if we heard anything about dinosaurs in Scotland. <laughs> and funny enough... It turned into a conversation with Chris about the Isle of Skye, and then this week we came across an article by the Herald about Scotland's Jurassic Isle, a.k.a. the Isle of Skye. So, here you go, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the article talks about how in April of 2015, Dr. Steve Brousset and Dr. Tom Challens, along with a group of students, found the largest trackway of dinosaur prints found in Scotland. They were of sauropods from the Middle Jurassic, and their prints are really big. It took them all day they were looking for something much smaller, and then they kind of realized at the end of the day that uh, what they thought were just these rocks in weird formations were actually these giant sauropod prints, and they had to step back far enough away to get a good picture. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. So there's a lot of other dinosaurs that have been found on Sky, including Megalosaurus, Stegosaurus, and Cityosaurus, which is a sauropod. So the Megalosaurus tracks, there were some found in 2002. Uh, in 1982, a footprint was found that's thought to be made by an iguanodon-like ornithopod. Also in 1992, a partial tibia of a theropod was found, as well as a fragment of a sauropod similar to a cetiosaur. In 2008, the first theropod tooth was found. If you're visiting Skye, you can go to the Staffen Museum, which was founded in 1976 and showcases fossils. And apparently every year something new turns up, so there's still a lot more to be found on that island. Pretty cool. Yeah. Next, we have some Jurassic World 2 slash Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom news. Yeah, because it's, it's definitely Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom now. We've been calling it Jurassic World 2 a little bit longer than we should have. So, potential spoiler alert. Yeah, so if you don't want to hear about what's going to potentially happen in that movie or what dinosaurs there may or may not be, skip ahead like a minute. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's a brief update. Yeah, the filming has wrapped. And according to MovieWeb, there might be a new hybrid dinosaur, which doesn't surprise me. Colin Trevorrow shared an image of J.A. Bayona with a dinosaur on Twitter, and it looks like a raptor, and it's in a cage. Other set photos show dinosaurs in similar cages, so this new raptor might be called Indoraptor, and it's obviously going to be smaller than Indominus Rex if it's a raptor. Universal trademarked the term Indoraptor recently, which kind of leads more people to think that this is what's going to happen. And producer Frank Marshall also recently shared that there will be a volcanic threat in the movie. So huh. lots of things going on. Next, we've talked about this before as well, but we have an update for the iconic orange dinosaur that used to be on Route 1 in Sagus, Massachusetts. So the orange dinosaur was part of the Route 1 mini golf and batting cages, and now developers are turning that property into apartments, hotels, shops, and a parking garage. So the orange dinosaur, which has been around for about 60 years, it weighs 6,000 pounds and it's 20 feet long, and it Oof. now is in a temporary home, a vacant site next to a golf course. The developers who bought the site wanted to give back to the community, so they made t-shirts with the orange dinosaur and the words Sigasaurus and sold them for $25 each. Did they want to give back or did they want to make money? Both. Well, <laughs> they raised $6,800 in three months and they're donating the money back to the town. Oh, so there you go. they are giving it back. You're right. <laughs> that's a lot of shirts. Yeah, in three months, that's not that long of a time period, too. Yeah. People must like the orange dinosaur. I guess so. Maybe we should have made our dinosaur orange. We <laughs> have sold more shirts. <laughs> I don't know if that's why, but... <laughs> Next, Batman's latest series, Dark Knight's Metal, has an issue that shows Batman riding a dinosaur. And it looks like a carnivorous theropod. It's probably meant to be a T-Rex. But to quote paleontologist Scott Persons, who saw our tweet about this... He said, quote, I don't understand what's going on, and the premaxillary teeth are completely wrong, but dot, 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 cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny how wrong everything gets dinosaur anatomy. Yeah, but how often do you see dinosaurs in comics? True, yeah. And why is Batman riding one? <laughs> um, riding its head, too, not like sitting on its back or something yeah, normal. <laughs> I don't think it's the first storyline with Batman and dinosaurs. There's something about Dinosaur Island or oh, man. I think Superman did something with that, too, but I don't know the details. I yeah. just saw the picture. I was like, did he ride on Superman's back to go back in time like 70 million years? How does he even encounter dinosaurs? <laughs> I don't know. Probably mad scientists. That's usually the comic book way. Could be. Maybe we'll just have to read that issue. Report Maybe. Back. <laughs> <laughs> and last, PC Games announced a dinosaur game giveaway for the game Dinosis Survival, which is a survival shooter game with dinosaurs that also involves a mystery. And you have to figure out what happened to this world and where the dinosaurs came from. The game's on Steam, and PC Games is giving away 15 Steam keys. We'll post a link so you can enter to win. So before we get into our interview, we just want to announce again that we will be doing exclusive patron rewards for our SVP trip. So if you are a patron, before we go to SVP in four weeks, then you will get a special video that we'll make at the conference. Exclusively for our patron supporters. Yes. And if you are at the Stegosaurus level or above, we will also send you a special postcard. Yep, so, from Canada. From Canada, yes. Or Well, they might not be mailed out of Canada, but they will be postcards acquired in Canada at the very least. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have that new Spinosaurus level with the audiobook and new upcoming audiobook as well. And we were both in New York a few weeks ago around the 4th of July and we stopped by the American Museum of Natural History to see the Titanosaur exhibit Yep. because we hadn't been to New York since they installed that. Garrett was sad, though, that the Titanosaur plushie, which was really great, wouldn't fit in our suitcase, so we couldn't yeah, buy one. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. And it was on sale. It was really tempting. Yeah. I think it's one of the only times I've been as tempted to get a plushie as Sabrina was. <laughs> <laughs> so we were both like, we should get this. And we're like, oh, but it's kind of big. <laughs> and we, we have a lot of them. <laughs> there's Yeah, there's no room in our suitcase. Yeah, or that much room in our house left for <laughs> plushy dinosaurs. <laughs> but the Titanosaur exhibit was amazing. And we didn't get a chance to talk to anybody there. But we got a chance to talk to Danny Barta 
recently over Skype. So we're going to go into that interview about the exhibit now. Today, we're joined by Danny Barta, a PhD candidate in comparative biology at the American Museum of Natural History. And I didn't even realize that AMNH had a actual graduate program in the museum. I mean, I guess that's probably obvious to most paleontologists, but not to me. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it's, it's fairly new. It's just started a few years ago. It's the, the Richard Gilder Graduate School at the American Museum of Natural History, and it's the only PhD granting program run by a museum in, I think, at least the Western Hemisphere. Hmm. So uh, yeah, so it's a pretty unique program. The degree comes directly from the museum, and uh, they've graduated several classes already and spans kind of the whole discipline of comparative biology. So paleontology plus other aspects of the biological sciences as well. That's awesome. We love that museum. So <laughs> getting a diploma from AMNH just seems so cool. Yeah, it's really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so since you joined, I guess you switched over from Montana to New York in like 2014 or so? Yes, that's right. So how far along was this whole titanosaur exhibit that they recently installed at that point? So the titanosaur was installed at the beginning of 2016. Okay. And I believe it was discovered in 2012. So they would have been somewhere in the process of, of preparing the exhibit for display when I was there. So, uh, you know, really, really, I think it's, you know, kind of remarkably quick that from discovery to installation of this exhibit was, yeah. you know, only, only about four years. Um, and I, I think the excavation took about 18 months or so. Hmm. That must have really been all hands on deck <laughs> to get that huge thing yeah, out. Yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a big effort. And the m &H partnered with Research Casting International to, you know, make the actual casts that, that are on display. Oh, cool. So yeah. did Research Casting International then had to go down to Argentina to do it, I guess? Yeah, the, the bones were the bones were all 3D scanned. Mm. And then they were actually kind of printed out on like sort of a rapid prototyping type machine out of styrofoam. And then the molds were made from basically those styrofoam prints. And mm. then the whole skeleton was cast in fiberglass. And then that's what was put on display. Cool. So the American Museum of Natural History is in New York. And then mm -hmm. people find bones in Argentina. How, how did the American Museum of Natural History end up collaborating so far away? Sure. So, so the collaboration really came about because um, one of the two scientists leading the team that first excavated the titanosaur is uh, Dr. Diego Pohl. And he received his PhD in a joint program between Columbia University and AMNH. He was mm -hmm. a former student of uh, Dr. Mark Norell's and Dr. Norell is my advisor. And so really, uh, you know, th this, this was kind of the, the main connection between AM and H and the museum in Argentina that Dr. Pohl works at. Cool. And they just wanted more research to kind of excavate it as fast as possible. I think, yeah, exactly. They, they, yeah, just wanted collaboration with expertise from AM and H as well and to partner on, on this big exhibit. Cool. So you mentioned how fast it got out of the ground and on display, which is really remarkable. I mean, it doesn't sound that fast being like four years, but we right. talk all the time about things that are excavated and aren't published for like 17, 20, 25 years. Like, <laughs> so four years is pretty amazing. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, especially for a skeleton of this size. And it's, and it's not just one skeleton either. We, we have the largest individual, we have that on display, but there were actually remains from uh, six different titanosaurs all found at this site, six different individuals of this species. Wow. Since you mentioned the species, does that mean that people are thinking it's a new species and it's going to be called something other than the titanosaur soon? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think uh, you know, the general consensus right now from what I've been hearing is that it is a new species and that it will have a name um, hopefully fairly soon. There, I know that they're working on the scientific paper uh, right now. And so uh, once that comes out, you know, we'll be able to, you know, attach a, another name to it, a more specific name <laughs> than just the titanosaur. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I guess even though they rushed through getting it up and mounted, the whole scientific process of the peer review and making sure that it's got all the, you know, T's crossed and I's dotted in the paper still takes a while. For sure. Yeah, we don't want to rush any aspect of that. 
Cool. Yeah, we we're just at AM and H. What was that like? Two weeks ago? Three weeks ago? Well, it's already been two weeks. <laughs> and that was the first time we have been there since the Titanosaur got installed. So we like had to go and oh yeah, check it out. Spend a lot of time there. Oh yeah, yeah, it's very impressive. It, it amazed me with just how big it is. I feel like there's no real substitute for seeing it in person to get a real idea of the size. Yeah. Yeah, and like how it's jammed into a room that it barely fits in, <laughs> even though that room is huge. <laughs> touching the ceiling, and its head is is coming out towards the the elevators in the <laughs> in the entryway there. Yeah, yeah it's kind of like hunched over almost. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did they decide to like jam it into that room rather than putting it somewhere else? Was it just because of that room was mostly empty? Yeah, I think there was there's a lot of open space in that room. It was previously occupied by a smaller model of a Barasaurus, another type of sauropod dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that that dinosaur didn't come close to filling up that whole space. And so I, I think they, you know, saw that, OK, this is, you know, probably the best place in the museum where they had really enough open space to put in, you know, an animal that's 20 feet tall at the shoulder <laughs> and 122 feet long. So, yeah, really fills up that space nicely now. <laughs> it does. What happened to the Barasaurus that used to be in that room? As far as I know, it's um, being donated to another museum. Oh, cool. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. so it will continue to have life elsewhere, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a strong showing of Barasaurus in that museum with the rearing one, and then there was that yeah. little juvenile. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, we uh, yeah have some really important Barasaurus fossils for sure. What do you think of the rearing Barasaurus in the Teddy Roosevelt Rotunda? Yeah, so I think that's a really, um, I think it was intended to be kind of a, a really provocative sort of a skeletal mount in the sense that, you know, whether or not a Barasaurus could have really done that, I think it gets people thinking about how we as scientists would approach that question, you know, from from a, a, an engineering standpoint or a biomechanical standpoint or a, you know, behavioral standpoint, you know, can, could a big animal have really done something like that? So I think it was really intended to, you know, get people thinking about how do we actually know what we know about dinosaur function and behavior. So in that sense, I think it's, it's a really um, cool mount, you know, it's certainly spectacular visually and, mm -hmm. and also it, you know, hopefully inspires some, some questions about the scientific process for visitors. Yeah, that's really cool. It reminds me a little bit of Jack Horner's T-Rex being a scavenger versus a predator, where he's like, I didn't really necessarily think it was true. I just wanted to kind of prod at people. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Just, yeah. Trying to get him to think, you know, how we approach questions scientifically. Yeah. What kinds of evidence we'd look for. Cool. So back to the Titanosaur. It's really big, obviously. It barely fits in that room. How yeah. big is it compared to other Titanosaurs? So it is definitely one of the biggest. I, I think. I think more importantly than than just its sheer dimensions mm -hmm. is that it's basically the most complete titanosaur in that size range that's ever been found. So between all of those six individuals, we have I think roughly about seventy percent of the titanosaur's skeleton. Wow. So we're much better able to constrain its dimensions. We're not. Uh, we're not left trying to extrapolate its size from like a single bone, <laughs> as, as has been the case, you know, for some of these other large animals, you know, a single bone or a handful of bones. So it's, you know, definitely in, in the size class of, of something like an Argentinosaurus or a uh, Futalongosaurus or Dreadnoughtus or some of these other, you know, very large titanosaurs. But um, we have, I, I would say, much more of a complete record of this animal than any of those others. And so whether or not it turns out to be, you know, the very, very biggest one, it's, you know, certainly the very biggest one that we have a pretty good idea of, of what most of the bones in its skeleton look like. Yes, yeah, 70% is impressive, especially yeah. for such yeah. a large animal. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, um, yeah, there's been 223 fossil bones total excavated from that site so far. And the cast that you see on display, I think, incorporates about 80-something of those, I think. So it's, um, yeah, quite quite complete for, you know, a large animal like that. I think working with these large titanosaurs is, is hard because you're dealing with aspects of taphonomy. So, so everything that happens to an animal after it dies. So the taphonomic concerns with these large animals is that how do you actually bury something that large? <laughs> So I think that's a lot of the times why these animals are, 
um, not very complete is because you would just need a massive you know amount of sediment to you know flood from a river or some other depositional event like that to actually cover the whole body so oftentimes we're left with just a handful of bones and, and the skulls of these animals are very rare we don't um, know what the skull of the AM and H titanosaur looked like, for example, the reconstruction that you see is based on other close relatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's always like the hardest thing to find on sauropods. It seems like it's on the end yeah. of that super long neck. <laughs> it seems like somewhere <laughs> along the way, it always ends up, you know, dead ending. <laughs> Right, right, yeah. Ours has like thirty nine feet of neck, and so yeah, <laughs> the skull is you know positioned a long ways away from the body for sure. Yeah, I also sometimes think such a large animal dying, whether or not it was you know hunted or just died of some other event, would probably attract so many scavengers to it that you know that's right. got to really eliminate a lot of those bones from the. Taphonomy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, you know, you just think about being a massive input of, of biomass into that ecosystem when, when one of those, you know, animals would die, almost kind of like a whale fall or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of amazing thing about, yeah. So is there a theory about how so much of this material could have gotten buried? Is it like an avalanche kind of thing or something? I, I think the team is, is, you know, still actively studying that, but the preliminary information suggests that these six animals, and all of them are young adults, by the way, the, the titanosaur on display was probably not done growing completely. So, um, <laughs> so they think that these young adults, their, their deaths probably happened at sort of three distinct moments in time. Hmm. How far apart in time those events were, we're not really sure. But, um, you know, possibly they were part of a herd and they may have, you know, gathered together dying of stress or you know, from drought or something like that. But it's, it's kind of, kind of preliminary to, to really speculate too much about, you know, what the actual depositional conditions were until the scientific paper is published, I would say. But yeah, these most likely were, were animals that um, were living and also died together. Gotcha. Yeah. It makes sense that you, they would have to be nearby in order to collect that much <laughs> titanus over what's about to be quite a coincidence. Otherwise. Right. 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 Yeah. Cool. So you said that the original was, you had like 70% of the bones. Yeah. from And that's kind of between all six individuals. So, you know, some, some individuals have, you know, say some of the arm bones preserved and others have some of the leg bones and things. Mm -hmm. And, but kind of combining those and, and scaling them together, you can get an idea of what the anatomy of one individual would have looked okay. like. So for the titanosaur that's on display, they did that kind of scaling trick to combine everything into one. Yeah, yeah. so it's it's directly based on on 84 fossil bones, I think, from one skeleton. And then missing pieces are filled in from some of those other individuals from the site, as mm. well as close, closely related titanosaurs. Gotcha. So I don't know how much you know about the original titanosaur and I, I was referring to it as like the original but really I guess there's more like six originals <laughs> sure. is yeah. that like permanently housed somewhere yet or is it still I know they like set it up in a warehouse or something like that in Argentina for a while yeah so so there is yeah there's a there's another cast on display in Argentina I believe or will be on display soon and the original bones are are curated at the Museo Paleontológico Egidio Ferulio. Pardon my Spanish. Um, yeah, I've struggled through that one before too. Yeah, in, in <laughs> so that's that's the museum where Jose Carbillito and Diego Pol, the team leaders for this research, uh, work. And so so the bones are curated there, and they also have a, another replica of it there as well. And some of the bones were were on display uh, in New York last year. I believe they had. Uh, most of a forelimb on display here um, so that people could see the real fossil bones. They had the femur as well, this eight foot long femur. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, so those have all gone back now to Argentina, I believe. Cool. Yeah, it's nice that with the modern 3D printing and replica technology, you can leave the originals where they're found and have displays all over the place of such an amazing dinosaur. That's right. It allows yeah a lot more people to see it in person than might otherwise have been able to see it. Yeah. There's also something about, like, it's impressively big, right, when you're in the room. But then I remember yeah. on the other side of the room, there's that little display of different sauropod bones. And then when you see it up close and you're like, wow, this is, like, 
just this one little part. <laughs> yeah, like one vertebra. Right. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. It's really impressive. Yeah, that exhibit across across the hall from from the Titanosaur just opened up this year, and it, it highlights some of the history of, of research on giant sauropods at the AM H. So stretching all the way back to uh, Henry Fairfield Osborne and Barnum Brown excavating these giant sauropods in Wyoming, and and the AM H is still sending teams out to Wyoming to excavate more sauropod bones, <laughs> and so it um, allows visitors to kind of you know compare the size of the titanosaur with some of these bones from some of the more familiar sauropods like Apatosaurus and Diplodocus and and things like that, and it's really is substantially bigger. I mean, they were all very large animals, but the titanosaur is kind of in another league entirely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you were mentioning how it's not for sure whether it's the biggest or, you know, the second biggest or whatever. And it kind of reminds me when people ask, you know, is T-Rex the biggest predator or was like Carcharodontosaurus a little bit bigger or whatever? And it's like, well, at that point, you're splitting hairs, you know, it's like it's 40 or 42 feet long kind of thing, <laughs> you know. Exactly. And, and it all depends, too, on whether or not you're looking at a mature individual. Mm -hmm. And we feel pretty confident that this uh, titanosaur that's on display may not have been a mature individual. So it still may have had a little bit of, of growing to do. And so, you know, it's, it's hard if you're comparing something that is still growing to something that's finished growing. And identifying the you know largest member of any group is, is always kind of tricky. But um, yeah. yeah, certainly yeah, you're in you're in that large size category. And and. Um, you, you mentioned Kerkera dinosaurs, and I know they have evidence of those type of dinosaurs at the site where the titanosaur was found. I think they may have found some teeth or something. And uh, so we know that, you know, these very large carnivores were living alongside these, you know, very large herbivores. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Oh, yeah. Just a whole ecosystem of giants. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm always pleased to see these teeth everywhere it's really helpful that t-rex and all these other dinosaurs lost teeth all the time so there's a good record of where they went <laughs> that's that's right teeth are really helpful and yeah just trying to reconstruct kind of take a census of what animals were living in the in the ecosystem at the time yeah except for i've heard the mammal teeth are so small that we don't really know much about where <laughs> mammals were <laughs> Yeah, mammals, mammals, you have to really get down your hands and knees when you're looking for their teeth in the field. And we often have to use like scanning electron microscopes and things to really look at all the details from some of these very small teeth. It's funny. <laughs> cool. So you mentioned that there's that new exhibit in that corner that has all the awesome, yeah. you know, different sauropod bones and things. Are there any other new exhibits going to be added or maybe in other parts of the museum? Yeah, so that um, that's that's our most recent one for sure. Uh, we just had a dinosaur exhibit last year. It, it closed in January, but we had um, Dinosaurs Among Us, which I uh, was one of the scientific advisors for. And Dinosaurs Among Us um, focused on basically all of the multiple lines of evidence that scientists, many of them at the AMNH, have been able to bring to bear on this question of bird origins and the realization that birds are living dinosaurs. And uh, so this this is a really um, neat exhibit. Last year was was a really kind of special time for you know the paleontology department here because uh, not only did we have the titanosaur newly unveiled, but we also had that dinosaurs among us exhibit as well. I awesome. remember hearing about that. Yeah, is that going to travel to California, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think there's um, plans for it to travel now. Some of the pieces of exhibit I think may end up in a museum in Ohio that. AMH is partnering with, but um, I don't know all the, the details of that right now. Okay. Yeah, we saw the pterosaur exhibit that started at AMH in LA right. and now it's in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, that one is also very impressive. Yeah, some also some very large, large animals in that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah especially in those you start thinking about, oh, they could fly. How, how does that <laughs> <Right>. work? <laughs> yeah. Cool. So is there anywhere else that people should go to learn about work that you're doing that you're excited about? Yeah, so so I think the, the AMNH website is is always a great place to, to check out, amnh.org. Uh, there's a video series on there called um, Shelf Life, and uh, some of my research has, has been featured in a couple episodes of that, both in the actual video and the, and the text associated with it. There was one on the dinosaur Coelophysis, which was one of the earliest carnivorous dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And so for some of my research for my uh, PhD here at the museum, I'm trying to understand how Coelophysis grew. So I'm looking at its bone microstructure to um, try and understand its growth rate and you know what that might tell us about the age structure of the Coelophysis population and 
you know, things about early dinosaur metabolism. And then there's, there was also another shelf life on the museum's ongoing expeditions to Mongolia. Um, I participated in one of those um, two years ago now. Awesome. And uh, I talk a little bit in there just about some of the research that I'm also doing for my PhD on the small herbivorous Mongolian dinosaur Hyagriva. Uh, this is a small dinosaur similar to Erictodromius or Hypsilophodon, one of these um, beaked bird hip dinosaurs that ran around on two legs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, Mark Norell and I just recently published a paper on looking at the geographic distribution of this animal in Mongolia. And it turns out to be kind of crucial for linking the ages of some of the formations in the Eastern Gobi to some of those in the Western Gobi and trying to understand exactly how all these formations um, relate to one another, because there's really an absence of things like lava beds that can be aged directly. So the dinosaurs, it turns out, can be important for understanding the ages of the rocks. So um, yeah, so the AMNH website is always, you know, posting new things about the research of our staff members here. So I would point you in that direction. Um, there's some actually some really cool videos of the titanosaur on there, time lapse videos of how the titanosaur was uh, installed in the museum. Yeah, we watched that one. That was, <laughs> yeah, that was good. <laughs> Fun, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, if you ever want to come back on and talk about some of this new research, we'd be happy to have you back. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I'd love to do it. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining. Yeah, thank you so much. It was great talking to you. Yeah, great talking to you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Danny. We really enjoyed talking to you. And if you want to see pictures from our trip in New York, and of the Titanosaur especially, then you should check out our Instagram at I Know Dino. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Bahariasaurus, which was a request from Pezchet via YouTube. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. The name means Baharia lizard, and the type species is Bahariasaurus ingens. It was described in 1934 by Ernst Stromer. And the holotype consisted of two dorsal vertebrae, a neural arch, sacral vertebrae, a rib fragment, and other fragments. The type specimen was destroyed in World War II. It's not clear exactly how to classify it, but it's been assigned to a few theropod groups. In 1995, Oliver Raut compared Carcharodontosaurus and Bahariosaurus to Ceratosaurus, Torvisauridae, Tyrannosauridae, Salurosauridae, and Allosauroida, based on data that Stromer published in 1931, 1934, and 1936. Stromer named a new family in 1931, Carcharodontosauridae, for Carcharodontosaurus, and he thought that both Carcharodontosaurus and Bahariosaurus were theropods, but not closely related. In 1960, LaParent classified Bahariosaurus as a megalosaurid, and others agreed over the years, though in 1990, Molnar and others said it was Carnosauria in Certesidus, uncertain placement, and that Carnosauria consisted of Allosauridae and Tyrannosauridae. In 1991, Bonaparte said that it was more closely related to Abelosauridae and Noasauridae. But Raoult thought that Carcharodontosaurus and Bahariosaurus were closely related because they had more pleural soles in their caudal vertebrae, these hollow depressions to help decrease weight. So he referred both of them to Allosauroidea. And then in 2000, Churd suggested that it was Tyrannosauroidea. So again, not totally clear how to classify. All over the place, but mostly with big old meat-eating theropods. Yes. <laughs> It's also potentially synonymous with Deltrodromaeus, a theropod that lived around the same time in North Africa and has been found in the same formations, but it's too hard to tell since Bahariasaurus remains have been destroyed. Because again, Ernst Stromer, basically everything that he found was destroyed in World War II. And we haven't found anything new? Of Bahariasaurus? Yeah. I don't believe so. Oh. If Bahariasaurus and Deltrodromaeus are synonymous, though... That means Bahariosaurus slash Delta Dromaeus would have been large, estimated 26 feet or 8 meters long. But we need more specimens to know for sure and to classify Bahariosaurus. In 2016, it was suggested that Anoraptor, Bahariosaurus, and Delta Dromaeus could possibly be a not well-known clade of Megaraptor and Tyrannosauroids. But anyway, what we do know is that it was a large theropod that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now Egypt. <laughs> it was about the same size as Tyrannosaurus and Carcharodontosaurus, maybe. And it probably lived in the same time and place as Spinosaurus and Carcharodontosaurus, so that would have been an exciting time to live. Maybe terrifying. Too exciting. Yeah. <laughs> 
And our fun fact of the day is that spiders aren't insects, they're arachnids. But there's a dinosaur. What? Theme How to this. is this? <laughs> this was a rabbit hole here it went down to. It started, it had nothing to do with dinosaurs. I was just talking about spiders. And there's one spider that looks like an ant. It like simulates an ant. It uses its front legs to look like antenna. Anyway, so I wanted to know when spiders were around, if they were around with dinosaurs. And it turns out that spiders do predate dinosaurs. They were already walking on land before dinosaurs evolved. But the first orb weaving spiders, which is the technical term for spiders that make webs, didn't show up until much later. So the oldest direct evidence that we have for spider webs are webs that were trapped in amber with the spider from the early Cretaceous. What? There yeah. are webs found? Yeah. Cool. It kind of makes sense, too, because if you think about where a spider would want to make a web, you know, before people were around putting up buildings and stuff like that, it's pretty much trees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the best place to put them. And trees have sap and thus amber. So based on estimations from these finds, as well as other spider remains and kind of some genetic analysis from when things might have co-evolved from a certain point, it's estimated that the first orb weavers evolved in the Jurassic at some point, but we don't really know when. But it's likely that they weren't really that common until the early Cretaceous when lots of flying insects evolved. And that probably led to, you know, this kind of arms race between spiders and flying insects. And, you know, they try to catch them and eat them. And typical predator prey stuff. So the thing I thought was funny about this is that dinosaurs like T-Rex and Triceratops probably would have walked through a lot of spider webs. <laughs> oh, no. But Stegosaurus, Apatosaurus, and Allosaurus and other Jurassic dinosaurs probably wouldn't have had to deal with many spider webs, if any at all. Would they even notice? They're so big. I don't know. I mean, it could get you right in the eye. Oh, you know, they that walk, would be awful. It's their, they walk face first like most things. And then you've got T-Rex with his little tiny arms. Like, how do, would you wipe off a spider web if how, you're a T-Rex? Well, how would you as a Triceratops? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> really. Oh, yeah, that's even worse. Because you got like horns and frill in the way, too. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You probably just have to brush your face against some leaves Dunk or something. Dunk it in water. Yeah, maybe. I don't know if that works with spider webs. It'd be pretty awful. <laughs> it's really nice having hands and opposable thumbs. It is. <laughs> <laughs> but for those dinosaurs that were around before spiders, you know, a lot of people probably find that appealing. At least the orb weaving spiders. There would have been little ones crawling on the ground, mm. but no webs. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to join our Patreon page before we go to SVP so you can get in on those exclusive rewards. So you can visit the page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at I know Dino.